welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers the right to privacy, witnessing a crime, and private property, and comes to us from the Bateau Size channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. In the original two-part series posted on December 31st, 2016, YouTuber and First Amendment auditor Philip Turner was filming a traffic stop just off of Interstate 35 in New Braunfels, Texas, when he was contacted by Deputy Cameron Chen of the Comal County Sheriff's Office. What's that? Can you go stand back over where you work for me, sir? There's something wrong with being here? Yes, sir, there is. What's I that? Don't, I don't want you to be in direct line with that vehicle. I'd like for you to go back to where you were standing. You can continue filming all you'd like, but I don't, I don't want you right here. Am I interfering? Uh, well, technically, now you're starting to pose into somebody else's private property with, private your, property. with your video, videoing, yes, sir. Hey, did they give you permission to film inside their truck? I don't need permission out in public. In somebody's vehicle? I don't need permission out in public. No, not to film us, you're correct. But to film inside somebody's vehicle, that's an extension of their house, and that is a private place. So you do need somebody's permission to film inside their vehicle. But is that a crime? One of the deputies informs Mr. Turner that he cannot film the inside of someone else's vehicle without their permission, even if that vehicle is in a public place. Now, as we've discussed many times on ATA, the First Amendment protects the right to film anyone and anything within plain view of the public eye, because individuals have no expectation of privacy in public. Although the deputy claims that the vehicle is an extension of the owner's home and a private place, the diminished expectation of privacy an individual has in an automobile is well established in court decisions. In the 1976 case of South Dakota versus Opperman, the U.S. Supreme Court concluded that, quote, the expectation of privacy with respect to one's automobile is significantly less than that relating to one's home or office. First, the Opperman decision pointed to the fact that, quote, automobiles, unlike homes, are subjected to pervasive and continuing governmental regulation and controls, including periodic inspection and licensing requirements. As an everyday occurrence, police stop and examine vehicles when license plates or inspection stickers have expired fired, or if other violations such as exhaust fumes or excessive noise are noted, or if headlights or other safety equipment are not in proper working order. The court also concluded that, quote, the expectation of privacy as to automobiles is further diminished by the obviously public nature of automobile travel, citing its plurality opinion in the 1974 case of Cardwell versus Lewis, which held that, quote, one has a lesser expectation of privacy in a motor vehicle because its function is transportation, and it seldom serves as one's residence or as the repository of personal effects. It travels public thoroughfares where both its occupants and its contents are in plain view. Therefore, the deputy's assertion that Mr. Turner cannot film inside a vehicle in a public place without the owner's permission does not align with Supreme Court precedent on the issue. Do you have, do you have your information? Your driver's license? What's that? Do you have your driver's license or name dead birth? For what? Because now you're a witness to this crime that we're doing. What crime is that? crime that we got these people in the back of these cars for? I don't know what crime they committed. You don't have to know. Okay, they broke the law, they're in possession of narcotics, that's why they're in the back of our cars. So, do you have your name and date of birth? No. Or a driver's license? No. So you're gonna refuse to be listed as a witness since you're, you sat here and videotaped the entire scene? If you need a copy of the video, I can give you a copy of the video. Well, yeah, but we're also gonna need to identify you in our report that you were here videoing, so when we come to get a copy of that video, we can get that. All right, let me talk to your supervisor. He said that he won't want to give us her name, his name or date of birth until he talks to our supervisor. So. And you're probably going to end up going to jail because right now you're witnessing a crime. The deputies request that Mr. Turner provide his driver's license or his name and date of birth. And when he refuses, they inform him that he could be arrested for failing to identify himself because he was a witness to a crime. Under Section 38.02 of the Texas Penal Code, an individual can be charged with the crime of failure to identify for intentionally giving a false or fictitious name, residence address, or date of birth to a peace officer who has good cause to believe the individual is a witness to a criminal offense. Therefore, Mr. Turner could not be arrested under this statute for merely refusing to provide this information altogether. However, some states do criminalize a witness's refusal to give personal information when requested by a police officer. For example, Section 2921.29 of the Ohio Revised Code makes it a fourth-degree misdemeanor for an individual who is in a public place to refuse to disclose their name, address, or date of birth 
worth when requested by a law enforcement officer who reasonably suspects the individual witnessed certain types of felonies. However, the statute clarifies that, now quoting, nothing in this section requires a person to answer any questions beyond that person's name, address, or date of birth. Nothing in this section authorizes a law enforcement officer to arrest a person for not providing any information beyond that person's name, address, or date of birth, or for refusing to describe the offense observed. Because of the constitutional right to remain silent, individuals are generally not required to assist police officers in conducting investigations, and witnesses are not required to submit to questioning unless lawfully subpoenaed. However, witnesses who possess significant information necessary to resolve a criminal prosecution, who are referred to as material witnesses, can be arrested or otherwise detained in order to secure their testimony. In the 1953 case of Stein v. New York, the Supreme Court concluded that, quote, interrogation of those who know something about the facts is the chief means to solution of crime. The duty to disclose knowledge of crime rests upon all citizens. It is so vital that one known to be innocent may be detained in the absence of bail as a material witness. Many states, including Texas, only allow witnesses to be arrested if they fail to appear after receiving a subpoena to testify in a criminal case. However, under federal law, witnesses can be arrested even if they do not violate a subpoena. Section 3144 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code states that, quote, if it appears from an affidavit filed by a party that the testimony of a person is material in a criminal proceeding, and if it is shown that it may become impracticable to secure the presence of the person by subpoena, a judicial officer may order the arrest of the person. The statute also requires that witnesses are given the same type of bail hearing given to criminal defendants to determine whether they should be released, released on bail, or held in jail before the trial. According to Bureau of Justice Statistics, 5,594 material witnesses were arrested in 2016, which constituted 3.7% of total federal arrests for the year. It is highly unlikely that Mr. Turner would be considered a material witness by a court, but it would still be possible for the officers to arrest Mr. Turner in good faith, depending on the jurisdictional relationships between the department, the state of Texas, and the federal government. Well, I asked to talk to a supervisor. He's here, so why can I speak with him? Because you're refusing to give your information, you'll be going to jail for failure to identify as you're a witness to a crime. So I need to give you my so I need to give you my ID to speak to your supervisor? Is that what you're telling me? No. Okay, I need to speak why, to your supervisor. Why do you need to speak to your supervisor? Because I requested what to speak to him. That? Because I requested to speak to him and he's here. Okay. So what's your point? He's here, I need to speak with him. He's got you've got no part you of the scene, right? But you, you want to speak to our supervisor. You can you can speak to him. Okay. Yeah. But you'll be in handcuffs and it'll be at the jail. Is that what you want to do? I need to speak to your supervisor. Is that what you want to do? I need do? to speak to your supervisor. Why don't you understand it? You put yourself in this situation right here. You see that? You're on, on private what? property. Private right now. or public? You're on private property right now. Okay, what is that? What does that have to do with anything? Do you have permission to be here? Did the owner trespass me? Well, he actually, this guy. He doesn't want you here. This guy actually did quarter tell us he wanted you to leave. The deputies inform Mr. Turner, who was standing just outside a fence surrounding the entrance to a Camping World RV sales lot, that he is filming on private property and that the owner would like him to leave. Although the First Amendment protects the right to free speech in public places, including filming police interactions, it does not require private property owners to accommodate speech by others. The First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law infringing upon the freedoms of speech. And although the Supreme Court determined in the 1925 case of Gitlow v. New York that First Amendment freedom of speech is also protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment from state government restrictions, the courts have repeatedly determined that it is impossible for a purely private party to violate the First Amendment. Therefore, the First Amendment only protects against government restrictions on speech. This concept, which is referred to as the State Action Doctrine, means that private citizens do not have public constitutional obligations, and that the property owner was not required by the First Amendment to allow Mr. Turner to film on his property. However, Mr. Turner did not violate Texas law by filming the interaction. Section 30.05 of the Texas Penal Code states that an individual commits the offense of criminal trespass if the individual enters or remains on or in property of another without effective consent, and either had noticed that the entry was forbidden or received notice to depart but failed to do so. The statute defines notice as oral or written communication by the owner or someone with apparent authority to act for the owner 
fencing or other enclosure obviously designed to exclude intruders, a sign or signs posted on the property or at the entrance to the building indicating that entry is forbidden, the placement of identifying purple paint marks on trees or posts on the property, or the visible presence on the property of a crop grown for human consumption. Now, because Mr. Turner was filming outside of the fence, and there were no signs indicating that he could not stand there, he did not have noticed that entry was forbidden when he began to film. And, until the deputies told Mr. Turner that the owner wanted him to leave, he had not received notice to depart. It is highly unlikely that Mr. Turner could be legitimately arrested for criminal trespass under these circumstances. After the deputies inform Mr. Turner that the owner of the property has requested that he leave, the deputies then retrieve the camping world manager to deliver the message in person. After awkwardly telling Mr. Turner to leave, the camping world manager steps back while Mr. Turner and the sergeant have a discussion. So what's up? All right, so I can get you a business card. Yeah. Um, but this is what I do. I film what public officials do on public property. I'm a journalist. I gather content for stories. That's good. Cool. Uh, but this officer here was telling me that I had to move back over there. I couldn't stand over there. And I was asking him why. He told me that I, I wasn't allowed to film inside the vehicle here. But I mean, that's that's how, that's their privacy too. We got to get their consent to go in, so what makes it any different for you? Well, that's to go in. Yeah. But I'm not going in. I'm just I'm just observing. That's kind of like equivalent to this is his property, but I can't film it because it's okay. on his property. Okay. You know okay. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't make sense, and it's not against the law. Okay. So he needs to get educated on that because okay. that's clearly <laughs> not the case. Okay. okay. Now, am I currently being detained here, or am I free to go? You're free to go, man. Well, I, I, I'm here. Need, I came all the way from Canada Lake to we come need to, to you. Identify him, okay. right you yeah. need to identify me? Yes, sir, I do. For? Because you're a witness to a crime and you sat here and recorded the whole crime. I don't know what crime was committed. I told you. I didn't see you pulling you, in the car. And then you said that you still wouldn't identify yourself until you spoke to our sergeant. Now you spoke to the sergeant, so I need to get your name and date of birth. So I, I can, can give you a copy of the vehicle. I can give you a copy of the video. I don't need a copy of the vehicle. I can give you a business card. I need your identifying information so I can list you in the report as a witness. Yeah. Because right now you're filling ID as a witness to a crime. What crime? Hey, like, hey, what's, what's your first name? Man? I'll give you my first name. It's Philip. Philip. Yes. Philip. I'll give you that. Best case scenario. Best case scenario. That female and that male says that we did something against the law. Eight cops. Eight cops against one 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 person, right? So you know who I would want? I would want the guy who's not even involved in this to be my witness. So that's what we're trying to explain to you. So any as a witness? You're, you're part of a. You're part of a, it's. You're part of any type of information that anybody that comes in. We're going to have to ID him because he's in our cameras now. See, and I already got his business card. He already identified himself. So, so he gave his name and date of birth and all that yes, stuff? Yes, I've got it all right I here. said I can go get a business card too. I, I said that. Well, that's fine, but here's the thing. You can't leave until we identify you. Like I said, I already told you. I'm a journalist. I gather content hey, for fine. stores. That's, that's it. Hey, we had no problem with that, man. We just don't like the space. And that, okay. that's what I told you earlier. Right. I didn't have a now, problem with the video. Sorry. Am I free to go or am I being tamed? Initially, the sergeant attempts to justify the actions of his deputies, and Mr. Turner was not given the opportunity to engage with the sergeant because their conversation was being interrupted by phone calls. In between each call, the deputies would try to convince Mr. Turner to identify himself. But eventually, the sergeant hung up the phone long enough to have a conversation with Mr. Turner. I'm not up in your face. If I were up in your face, then you would know. You need anything from him? You good? I'm good. Do you want to make the phone call? Are you trying to identify him for us? Yeah. Let's go here. I uh, like I'm ready to argue, man. You're not doing anything wrong. And uh but here's the deal. They got a point there. I mean this your worst case scenario is that your camera would be a part of evidence, but we're not gonna go there because I have a camera. I have plenty of cameras going, so I don't need your camera. Now if something were to happen to where man we get into a shooting or something or a fight and somebody gets hurt. Then you know what? I'm taking your camera because that's so. You, you got to be careful with that in the, lot, in the future. Okay, when you're doing this, but, but, because, but because on that one, I, I, I'll tell you, no, 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 there no, no. was a shooting on Sixth Street that happened not too long ago, and I helped aid it them catching the shooting. And, and, and I have no problem with that. No, no, no. But that, but that's what that's what's called. Evidence. It's not. It's not that I want your camera because I want you to stop doing this. It's just that, man, you you would be surprised how much what how many angles we need nowadays. I, under, because, I understand that. You know, after speaking with Mr. Turner, the sergeant realized that he was not a threat and was within his rights to film the traffic stop. The sergeant allowed Mr. Turner to go free without identifying himself, but Mr. Turner offered to exchange business cards, and the sergeant obliged. In a video posted four days later, Mr. Turner visited the Comal County Sheriff's Office to file a formal complaint against the officers and file a public records request for the body camera footage. A 
although the clerk working at the front desk was rude, the officers were relatively cordial while Mr. Turner filled out the necessary paperwork, and the complaint was submitted without issue. It is unclear whether Mr. Turner sued the department or the deputies, but I suspect that filing a formal complaint was as far as he intended to go. Overall, the Comal County Sheriff's deputies get an F for displaying a fundamental misunderstanding of the First Amendment, misrepresenting the authority of Code 38.02, and maintaining a hostile and condescending demeanor throughout the interaction. Invoking the authority of Code 38.02 in an attempt to force a citizen or witness to identify themselves not only discourages other witnesses from coming forward in the future, but it also has the potential to corrupt the evidence that may have been available from their testimony. If a witness feels threatened by the officers, then it is unlikely that their testimony will be reliable in court, and their statements could potentially be dismissed altogether. If the deputy's objective was to identify Mr. Turner as a witness, then the deputies should have de-escalated the situation and asked for Mr. Turner's cooperation. Instead, they accused him of trespassing, illegally recording, failing to identify himself, and a host of other crimes. It is clear that the driving force for this interaction was the egos of the deputies and their ignorance of the law. And if the sergeant hadn't intervened, well, then this interaction would likely have had a different outcome. Sergeant Montanez gets an A- because although he initially attempted to validate the conduct of the deputies and was operating under certain misconceptions about the law, the sergeant engaged in a productive dialogue with Mr. Turner, realized that he was within his rights, and allowed Mr. Turner to go free without being forced to identify himself. Once the sergeant was able to engage in a dialogue with Mr. Turner, the tides began to turn in his favor. Sergeant Montanez took the time to listen to Mr. Turner, and ultimately made the decision to allow him to go free. I commend Sergeant Montanez for exercising professional discretion, and for making an effort to listen to Mr. Turner's concerns. The sergeant's field experience and willingness to listen significantly contributed to the de-escalation of this encounter, and this is one interaction where requesting a supervisor dramatically dramatically altered the outcome. Mr. Turner gets an A+, for remaining calm and collected throughout the entirety of the interaction, displaying a thorough understanding of the relevant laws at play, and following up this interaction with the proper means of complaint. Not every bad interaction with law enforcement will be worth the time and financial burden of a lawsuit, and filing a complaint and documenting the incident may be enough to render the results that favor you and your community. In this situation, it is entirely possible that the deputies involved were retrained, and now respect the right to record as a result of Mr. Turner's complaint. And although filing a complaint may not always render dramatic results, it is worth doing in situations where a lawsuit is not an option. If an officer were to be sued in the future, then it is entirely possible that their complaint history would be a relevant factor in deciding such a case. Mr. Turner's ability to remain calm and focused while interacting with the police is impressive. But, considering that he has been conducting audits for over six years, and is responsible for relatively major legislation regarding the right to record police in the Fifth Circuit District, it comes as no surprise. I commend Mr. Turner for exercising his rights peacefully and professionally, and engaging in a civil conversation with the sergeant. Mr. Turner is one of the most professional auditors in the community, and I highly recommend taking a look at his channel. You can find a link in the description below. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic that you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out the ATA Patreon page for even more police interaction content.